nature towards Jews and conspiracies about Jewish power and influence that we have seen in imagery today of the insurrection at the Capitol, the ideology of QAnon, social media of Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, and, and so forth. So we're gonna hear from our four experts today on a variety of historical um, antecedents to these that will help us understand what's going on today more as well as elaborating more on some of these events. Um, just very quickly, many of you have come to many of our teachings and panels and lectures on anti-Semitism in the past few years. Uh, we have something every year, either from our in-house experts like we're having today or international um, scholars from across the world that we bring in. Uh, we, of course, unfortunately had a teaching after the, uh, uh, the murder of the worshipers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 2018. And we've uh, joined forces with lots of other programs on campus to discuss the uh, dangers of white nationalism and ultranationalism. Um, many people have been talking about the increase in anti-Semitism over the past few years. Just a couple indicators, and you'll hear um, much more um, today is that according to the FBI hate crime report, while Jews are only 2% of the population, there are 60% of religiously based hate crimes, which has gone up every single year in the past few years. Uh, and um, so there is a lot of hate crime uh, and uh, against houses of worship and, um, uh, and, and many others. There's also a danger of increased legitimization of anti-Semitism, where it's just in everyday language among uh, many people that the tropes that Professor Simon will be talking about, sometimes people unknowingly even um, adopt some of those as they become more legitimate in our conversation. And just one more statistic is that there was a survey um, in all 50 states of millennials and Gen Z about knowledge of the Holocaust. Um, and 63% of the American population in that age group, which includes our students um, did not know that 6 million Jews died in the Holocaust, and 36% thought it was less than 2 million, and 48% could not name a single concentration camp or ghetto. So this gives you just a little bit of context why we're annually addressing the issues of anti-Semitism. Uh, and both uh, Professor Firm English in her classes, and Amy Simon especially in her classes, and she has a class on anti-Semitism, um, that Ken Walzer also taught for 43 years at Madison, um, why unfortunately there's an increasing need for this knowledge and conversation. So I'm going to um, introduce our speakers and then we'll hear from them and then we'll have hopefully lots of questions and discussion from you if you could please um, write any questions you have in the Q&A and then I'll, I'll, I'll read them and accumulate them and pose them um, to our experts, our in-house experts. So first, we're gonna have um, Dr. Amy Simon speak to us. She holds the William and Audrey Farber Family Chair in Holocaust Studies in Euro European Jewish History at MSU. Uh, she teaches at James Madison College where I teach and Ken taught and John Jackson also teaches. Um, and she also teaches in the history and is a core member of the Sterling Institute. She's worked as a researcher at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, held the Leon Millman Memorial Fellowship for research there. And she regularly gives public lectures on Holocaust history, diaries, and pedagogy for academic and lay audiences. Her work on Holocaust fiction, memoir, diaries, and pedagogy has appeared in Holocaust Studies, a Journal of Culture and History, Jewish Historical Studies, the Journal of Jewish Identities, and a number of edited volumes. And as I say, she actually teaches our class on anti-Semitism at MSU. She'll address the major tropes of anti-Semitism that are still relevant in today's conspiracy theories about the Jewish world and power, concerning Jewish power. Um, then we'll hear next from Professor John Jackson. He's a historian of science who specializes in the scientific study of race and teaches at James Madison College. His most recent book, co-authored with David DePew, is entitled Darwinism, Darwinism, Democracy, and Race. And he is currently working on a history of the alt-right in the post-World War II United States. Uh, he'll be discussing anti-Semitism in the United States in the 1950s and 60s. And then we have Professor uh, Fermeglish, who's also Associate Director of the Serling Institute this year and Professor of History and Jewish Studies at MSU. She's the author of A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, which won the Sal Wiener Prize for the best book in American Jewish history from the American Jewish Historical Society in 2019. 
and American Dreams and Nazi Nightmares, Early Holocaust Consciousness in Liberal America, 1957 to 1965. And then with Lisa Fine, who's the chair of the history department, she also co-edited the Norton Critical Edition of Betty Friedan, the feminist teacher. She's currently co-editor of the journal American Jewish History, along with Daniel Sawyer and Adam Mendelson. And she teaches classes on American Jewish history and American Jewish culture. And she'll be discussing the Turner Diaries and anti-Semitism in the United States in the 1970s. So we're going from kind of ancient long-standing tropes that are used today to anti-Semitism in the 50s and 60s, anti-Semitism in the 1970s. And then Professor Ken Walter will bring us up to all the events going on today and how those historical events inform uh, these events. He's Professor Emeritus of History in James Anderson College at MSU and former director of Jewish Studies. He's a serious student of anti-Semitism. He says humbly in the bio he sent me, although of course he taught this class on anti-Semitism for 43 years. Um, he led a national organization committed to fighting anti-Semitism on American campuses and he's also a student of life beyond extremity in the camps and of rescue during the Holocaust. So um, it's a wonderful that we have these four experts um, here uh, to talk with us and Professor Amy Simon will um, start us off. So please do write your questions in Q&A. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Professor Aronoff and um, welcome. I have the maybe dubious honor of being the first uh, in, in this you know, difficult panel. Um, I have a few slides that I'll share with you. I think that a lot of what I have to talk about, um, the visual complements very nicely what I have to say um, because so much of what I'm talking about is um, about myth, about trope, about image. It's about images of Jews rather than about Jews necessarily themselves. And so I have some images to share with you. Um, so let me do that. Um, and so hopefully people can see the slides that I have, yes? Okay. Um, let me get to the, okay, it's not going away. Uh, <laughs> I need to get to the slideshow. Um, Okay. Okay, so um, so my task is is the the task of the historian, which is to take us pretty far back. And the reason that I'm doing this section is because um, although I'm a Holocaust scholar and I will spend a lot of my examples come from the Holocaust period, um, I also am teaching this Jews and anti-Semitism course that Professor Walzer piloted and taught for 43 years. Um, and, I, and I'll start with an anecdote, which is that when I started, uh, or when I was interviewed for this position, it was um, in 2015. And you know, I knew that this would be a class I would have to teach. And I thought, okay, I can do that. And I know the history of anti-Semitism. And I had absolutely no clue, really, I mean, maybe I was naive, I don't know. I had no clue how relevant it would be, get, thinking about all of the things that Professor Aronoff just talked about in terms of these increases in anti-Semitism. And every year when I teach this class, there is some kind of new and horrific thing, anecdote of, of you know, current events uh, with which I start the class. And so, um, so I just chose today a couple major tropes, there are so many more, right? We spend the whole semester thinking about them uh, in the class, but a couple major tropes to focus on because of the ones kind of most relevant, I think, to the conversation about what has been going on, especially uh, in light of the January 6th uh, insurrection at the Capitol and some of the images there. So just a note on the vocabulary, we're talking about tropes. A trope just means for this purpose a recurring theme. So something that we see over and over. This is the way I basically teach the anti-Semitism classes. We just continue following these tropes uh, throughout time and place. And so I've chosen a, a couple, like I said, to focus on today. Um, and then just a brief warning that there are some graphic anti-Semitic images. So just be prepared for that as we move forward. Some things that honestly make me feel a little nauseous. Um, so we'll start with one. Um, the first trope that I want to talk about is that of the blood libel. And um, many of you probably haven't heard of the blood libel, unless you're in my class. Um, and what it is, plain and simple, is a myth that Jews kill Christian children to use their blood in religious ritual. This is what it has meant historically. 
It started in the year 1144, it's the first recorded instance of it, became quite a phenomenon throughout the medieval period. Um, and you have an image here. So the, the accusation uh, was, you know, anytime, uh, or not anytime, but many times when a young child would go missing, um, if they would turn up dead, um, Jews often were blamed for that. And this, this rumor spread that they were using Christian children in all manner of ritual uh, practice. Um, and so you have an image here. This is from a famous blood libel case of Simon of Trent, uh, which is in modern day Italy in 1493. Um, and these kinds of images were um, uh, spread along with the stories about the, the evil things that Jews were doing. And um, the first known case that I mentioned came in the year 1144. So we're talking about a very old um, story about Jews that r retains its relevance, unfortunately, today. Um, so in this case, it was a boy, William of Noritz, who was found dead um, and mutilated, and local people accused Jews of the act. And it, like I said, there were hundreds of these cases in the next several hundred years, all throughout ev every country in Europe, um, of accusations that different Jews in different places killed children um, to use their blood uh, particularly. I should say, I probably don't have to say, but just to be clear, the claim is completely unfounded. Jews have never done this. There are no rituals in Jewish practice that call for blood or sacrifice. So again, this is about an image of Jews and it had a lot of historical reasons for developing in this time, but to suffice it to say, it was widespread um, and it has led to the murder of hundreds of Jews, uh, probably thousands of Jews throughout time, uh, just in that period. It actually went away kind of briefly um, in the early modern period and resurfaced again pretty strongly in the 19th century and into the 20th century. Um, and so Jews have been killed as a result of this because, you know, there were those often mob violence against Jews who were accused of such a crime in, in whatever town they were in. There were often um, cases, you know, court cases against Jews who were sometimes convicted despite the fact that, that it was not true and, and killed. And Jews were um, sometimes even expelled from the towns, you know, the remaining Jews uh, when a blood libel case um, came about. So this has been one trope that has followed Jews throughout time. And then the second major trope, which has a couple sub tropes uh, that I wanna focus on is the conspiracy to dominate. And this one takes so many forms, and this is the main thing about it. Um, this is the belief that Jews seek to establish global dominance by controlling or manipulating people through politics, economy, or media. So these are kind of the main um, parts of it. And like I said, it has taken many forms throughout time. I'm gonna talk about a couple of more modern, um, you know, 19th and 20th century examples uh, from Europe. And the images here are very important. We see the image of the stereotypical Jewish visage um, with the large nose and kind of nasty looking face and the Jewish star in case you weren't clear. Um, and it says, uh, it's hinted in Finnmachen, uh, behind the enemy powers the Jew. And so you have the British flag, the American flag, the Soviet flag. And so the, the idea is that Jews are manipulating every major world power in order to create World War II. This is from Germany in 1942. Um, and so this one is slightly older and really gets to a second part. So that's a political manipulation. And the second one comes from France in the year 1898. Um, and at the bottom of it, it says Rothschild, right? So this fellow is meant to be um, of the Rothschild family. And this is an ongoing trope of Jews being um, uh, controlling the world through money, uh, but not just any Jews, very often this idea of the Rothschild family. This was a banking family in Europe, a Jewish banking family. They had um, yeah, family members in different countries and they, they were prominent, um, but this kind of, you know, uh, reasonable, prominent, you know, business that this family had be, has become this outsized uh, accusation that Jews, as personified by this one family, are trying to take over the world through their wealth and money and power. And I think this image also does a great job. You've got the coin, you've got this uh, Rothschild um, with this golden crown um, gripping the world, right? So this is the idea that Jews are have this outsized uh, importance economically. 
And just two more examples and I will be done. Um, so since early Christianity, so this goes back even before blood libel, Jews have been associated with plots to control the world and establish a Jewish world order. And the idea is that they are planning to destroy Western Christian culture by controlling the mechanisms of worldly power from behind the curtain. So this, um, I thought, was a fantastic example of this. This is from Nazi-occupied Serbia in 1941. And um, you have the image of a Jew. This is also about Masons, which is something different. But um, for now, we'll focus on the Jewish imagery. Clearly, there's a Star of David. And this guy is holding the puppets, uh, which is Stalin and Churchill. So very clearly, again, accusing Jews of, of all of the evil of World War II and being behind every world order. And we have, again, a very typical type of, um, you know, the Jew grasping the world. This is from Vichy, France, during World War II as well, the Jew in France, um, uh, and demonstrating this kind of outsized power against the world. So finally, and this has to do with another version of Jews trying to control things, um, is this idea of um, disease-induced anti-Semitism. So, uh, included within conspiracies of global dominance is the scapegoating of Jews to explain disease. So in the blood libel, we had Jews being scapegoated for children who've gone missing, who have been killed. And here we have the scapegoating of Jews uh, when terrible diseases take hold. And the kind of classic example is of the Black Death, which occurred between the years 1348 and 51, in which Jews were um, blamed en masse and, and persecuted and um, and in fact murdered en masse as a result of the completely false accusation that it was in fact Jews who were poisoning wells and spreading the plague. And here we have another pretty horrible representation of a, a murder of Jews uh, during that time to um, you know, represent trying to uh, get back at these Jews and end and, and their supposed um, um, you know, persecution of, of Christian society. Um, I think I'm out of time. Am I out of time, Yao? You are, but you can take another couple minutes. Um, okay, I'm, absolutely. This is my yeah. last slide, but I just don't want to overstep. Um, the last one, and I bring this up because, again, it's just about the conspiracy to dominate, but it's an example that is important for two main reasons. One, it shows us um, a, a, a moment in time in uh, Russia where um, kind of a modern conceptualization of uh, the conspiracy to dominate took hold. And it was this accusation for the, the very clear accusation for the first time that there was an organized plan of all Jews in the world um, through this secret meeting of Jewish world leaders, right? This again, never happened, completely false, but it was a pamphlet that was um, published claiming that it was the secret minutes of a Jewish world order who were planning world domination. It lays it out. I teach it in depth in my class. It lays out the points that Jews were supposedly going to use to take over the world. And why this is so important is it took off. It became translated, as you can see here, into basically every language. It continues to be translated today. And it claims to be the answer to all of the problems in the world. If you just look at what the Jews have done, you know, and we have the paper here, the protocols, again, false, but um, even though it's been publicly declared false since 1921, it still continues to be um, uh, published and distributed today. And so this idea of conspiracy um, was made very clear in that particular pamphlet and had a lot of traction in the United States as it was distributed also by Henry Ford in his Dearborn Independent. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think uh, Professor John Jackson is next. I don't know if you have to unshare your... No, no, um, it says new share. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So I can go ahead and... Yeah, try it. This will stop screen oh, sharing for I others. Got it. I got it. Hello, audience. We're professionals. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I am going to um, leave the medieval period behind, but you'll find a lot of these themes uh, are going to be continuing. So my focus here is going to be on the post-World War II United States 
uh, which we are still living in. And uh, I'm going to focus specifically on Holocaust denial. So here is the UNS Review, taking its name from Ron Unz, you see listed here on the right as a columnist and the editor of chief. Ron Unz is himself Jewish, but is in fact running a website here of essentially Holocaust denial. Uh, this is the books banned by Amazon. You can see the banner there on the right hand of your screen. And right under that, you see an advertisement for the dispossessed majority by uh, Wilmot Robertson. Wilmot Robertson is actually the man who coined the term the ethno state, calling for uh, a racial basis of civilization in the 1970s. And this is all over the alt right network. But you can see the kind of, of titles sold by the UNS Review, which does not advertise itself as any kind of anti-Semitic or denialist website. And that's something I think we should keep in mind here, that it presents itself as alternative media. So keep this in mind. I'm going to move to a different topic now, which is the first statement by the Trump administration issued on January 17th, 2017 on the Holocaust Remembrance Day. And if you just read this very quickly, it sounds very nice, um, but it does not mention Jews as particular targets for the Nazi genocides in Europe. It's by not mentioning Jews, it seems to erase kind of the central core of Nazi ideology, which was the destruction of Jewish people and replacing them with good, strong Aryans. And when they issued this, there was a lot of criticism, not just from Jewish groups, but from historians, from, from, from all kinds of folks. And Sean Spicer in a press conference called the criticisms, um, I forget, pathetic. And Sebastian Gorka, uh, who was a major figure in the uh, administration, called them asinine, that there's no reason we need to mention Jews, particularly as victims of the Holocaust. And it's ridiculous to think that this statement here is a denial of the Holocaust. And that's because one reason that that might be minimally plausible is because when people think of Holocaust denial, they think of the things that you would find at uns.com, the kind of things that say, well, the Holocaust didn't happen. It was simply a Jewish lie that these six million Jews were killed by the Nazis uh, in camps and by the Einsatzgruppen and, and, and through other kind of horrific means. But that's not the only thing. So they think of things like this. So these are just some sort of uh, uh, since the 50s. Actually, the, this, the bottom one here is from 1948, which is the first mention I can find in kind of the anti-Semitic literature um, of, of the denial that six million Jews were killed. But to focus on this aspect of the Holocaust, the idea that the Holocaust is part of a lie per perpetrated by Jews who conspiratorially want to take over the world, is I think to miss the point of what kind of criticisms were being leveled at that statement. And I think focusing on what Deborah Lipstadt, a historian of Holocaust denial, um, calls hardcore Holocaust denial is to miss the subtleties that are going on here and kind of the insidious nature of the anti-Semitic Holocaust denial view. So here's what she had to say, part of what she had to say about the Trump administration's uh, statement. It's softcore denial, right? And she's using these kind of pornographic images, um, uh, uh, or this pornographic language, rather, overtly and on purpose. Um, softcore denial doesn't say these events didn't happen, but it minimizes them. It says Jews were not any special victim. It points to reasons it claims that Jews use the Holocaust to leverage political power in support of Israel or to extract money from allied countries or something like that. It, 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 it invites comparisons to the Holocaust, minimizing what happened to the Jews under the Nazi regime. And I think it's going to be, I'm just going to very quickly here kind of go through the history of this kind of Holocaust denial, because this kind of Holocaust denial to me seems much more uh, dangerous because it seems much more reasonable than these outright lies um, perpetuated by the extreme anti-Semitic right. 
<clears throat> so American Holocaust denial actually starts before the war, the America First movement. So you can see on the top here, this is America First, which was a Trump administration when he was running for president in, in 2015, 2016, uh, was a slogan of his, but it's not original with him, so a few things are. It's actually the name of an anti-war movement that try to keep us out of World War II. And this is the bottom image here, the American First Bulletin, uh, telling us an article here with the headline, the blame for the rift with Japan rests on the administration, the Roosevelt administration. Japan wants only peace. Not only will they never attack the United States, they are in fact incapable of attacking the United States. And then if you look up at the date this was issued, it was issued the day before the attack on Pearl Harbor. America first shut down after that attack and went quiet for the duration of the war, but never really lost hold of the idea, which was primarily the province of conservative Americans and far right Americans, but a few lefty pacifists as well, that we should never have entered World War II. After the war, they tried to keep this idea alive, that it was a mistake for us to enter World War II. And you get a whole host of books that I won't describe here and articles about how FDR planned the attack on Pearl Harbor or allowed it to happen as a way to back us into war. Well, America First was actually already, even before the war, thought of as having tinges of anti-Semitism in it. So this is a Friends of Democracy, a liberal watchdog anti-fascist group. Charles Lindbergh, a leader of American First, was by far the most popular American alive, probably, except for maybe a couple of movie stars. He had flown across the Atlantic solo for the first time, an American hero. And in Des Moines, Iowa, on September 11th, 1941, he listed the Jews as trying to drag us into war. And got some pushback on that. And the idea is Lindbergh, a Nazi, um, was outrageous to many, but this idea that he was sharing Nazi ideology um, was very much um, accepted by a lot of people on the left and liberals in general. So after the war, we get a whole host of books here, and these are all written by Americans. Um, the first one, Gruesome Harvest, I have not been able to find anything about Ralph Franklin healing. If, if any of my fellow panelists or in the audience know anything about that guy, let me know. Um, but Rene Wernzer was an author. Frida Utley was a, was a, uh, a well-known journalist, a right-wing journalist, conservative journalist. Uh, Charles Callan Tansel was a historian at Georgetown. I got my eye on the time. I have just a few more minutes. All of which saying FDR backed us into the war. These books, also by American publishers, told us the same thing. The thing that marks these out is these are all members of fascist parties in Europe who get their books published over here and are basically indistinguishable from books by American conservatives arguing the same sort of thing. We should never have entered World War II. Hitler wasn't so bad. The big one by by FJP Veal, a, a member of Oswald Mosley's um, a fascist Brit British party. And you can see the sorts of things written here on the left. I've just written a few. Morgenthau, Hans Morgenthau plan, the second bullet point there. This plan that is mentioned here has never, was never enacted. And yet this idea that this was as bad or worse than anything the Nazis did remained the soft core denial pushed by an American publisher, the same publisher, by the way, no, it's not the same publisher, I'll take that back. Um, but on the right here, hoax of the 20th century, 1976 was the first kind of really detailed, hardcore Holocaust denial book, they quote Veal. Murray N. Rothbard, a well-known libertarian theorist, quotes Veal. Patrick J. Buchanan ran for president. You can still catch him on television talk shows, quotes Veal in this book, arguing that we should never, never have entered World War II. And the politically incorrect guide to American history does the same thing, that the crimes of the allies equaled or exceeded those of the Nazis. And uh, as you see from the sticker, it's a New York Times bestseller, published in 2014. 
By the end of the 70s, the so-called Institute for Historical Review starts, which kind of solidifies it as the marker for anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial. Marjorie Taylor Greene publishes on Facebook a, uh, a video made by another British fascist, Nick Griffin of the British National Party. And the Barnes Review is the journal for Holocaust denial. This is the current issue, hoping that their dreams of a whites only America does not die with President Trump. So thank you for your time. And uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you for your historical overview of uh, Holocaust denial and antisemitism. And now we'll turn to Professor from English will bring us into the 1970s, I believe. All right, I forgot to unmute. I apologize. Okay. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of uh, the panelists. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is indeed the 70s, but it's actually a very specific element of the 70s um, that has gotten some, has had some discussion in the media, but um, I think it would be, I wanted to be able to sort of um, uh, open it up to, to sort of more discussion. Um, so this is a picture that I think everybody saw or that most people saw um, in the wake of the Capitol riots. Um, insurrectionists built this gallows, right? And this is this really powerful image of these gallows um, in front of the Capitol. Um, and then I wanna remind people of some of the, the reporting that's come out about the riots, uh, reminding us of some images that we saw this man, Robert Barnett, um, uh, with his legs up on Nancy Pelosi's desk, um, also carrying um, a stun gun, um, a really powerful stun gun. Um, insurrectionists marched through the halls of the Capitol, um, calling Nancy, where are you Nancy, and hang Mike Pence. They were carrying zip ties and handcuffs, um, zip tie handcuffs and stun guns, um, indicating that they sought to capture members of Congress, perhaps to do them harm, um, including this stun gun, um, and grabbed and destroyed journalists' equipment. Um, one man fashioning a noose out of one of the electrical, electronic cords um, of this journalists. And I bring all this together because um, these are actually sort of images um, that for scholars who know about this text, the Turner Diaries, um, there are actually a lot of echoes about this book, which was written in 1978. Um, the, the, um, it says Andrew McDonald, that is actually a pseudonym. Um, and I'll go into the author of it for a second. Um, uh, the Turner Diaries um, is a dystopian science fiction. Um, it uh, begins with a story of basically imagining that the US government, which is run essentially by a Jewish conspiracy, um, is taking away people's guns. Um, they are sending armed uh, groups of um, black men to people's homes to take away their guns, um, to imprison them for gun ownership. 800,000 people are imprisoned this way. Um, and in the wake of this, this, these acts, um, a group called the Organization forms to fight back with guerrilla warfare. I, I should say, I have not read this book. Um, I don't really want to, to be honest with you. Uh, I have no desire to do this. <laughs> I kind of feel like I drew the short stick by, by even having to do the reading on this today, um, because it's pretty horrific if you actually even just read the summaries of it. Um, uh, it basically becomes, you know, sort of a tale. It's actually told as dystopia. If anyone's similar, familiar with The Handmaid's Tale, it's actually a very similar device. It sort of imagines you um, in the future telling back to the story of this horrible U.S. government and the way that the organization fought back. And it then becomes kind of a manual of the terrorist tactics um, and the guerrilla warfare that the organization used. Um, it's told from the, um, from the perspective of a man named Earl Turner but it tells about the warfare that is used to bring down the US government. Among the things that, um, that are described are the day of the rope. As the organization begins to fight back with guerrilla warfare, it is successful in turning whites to its cause. 
um, and when it um, successfully um, institutes a day of the rope, which is mass lynchings. That is the significance of the gallows and the significance of the noose. There are nooses that string up um, race traitors tens of thousands of race traders all over the country. They are made to wear um, signs that say, I'm a race defiler. These are people who are journalists, who are members of Congress, who are politicians, who are teachers and professors and lawyers and um, members of interracial um, uh, marriages and relationships, right? These are all the race traders. And it is the day of the rope in the telling of this story that enables the organization to get closer to um, both terrifying the populace um, and bringing whites over to their side um, and ultimately taking down the US government. The Turner Diaries also features an attack on the Capitol, even though it didn't look precisely like the attack on the Capitol that we saw. Um, it does, in fact, imagine an attack on the Capitol. And people who are live streaming, who were live streaming during the Capitol, were, in fact, um, seeing the Turner Diaries in this. So one user on social media posted, the Turner Diaries mentioned this, keep reading. Um, this was imagery that people who study um, the extreme right were watching and that people on the racist right knew that they were mimicking. The Turner Diaries has been called the Bible of the racist right. Um, and I'll show later in this PowerPoint um, ways that, it, um, that, uh, that um, it has been used in multiple other violent acts in the 20th and the 21st centuries. Um, so I mentioned that the author was a pseudonym. It was not actually written by Andrew McDonald. It was written by a man named William Pierce. Um, he was uh, born in Atlanta in 1933, um, uh, became a physicist, actually a fairly successful physicist at first, um, but became increasingly attracted to um, uh, white racism, uh, saw um, the American Nazi party leader speaking um, and decided to contact him, became a leading member in the National Socialist White People's Party, which was essentially the American Nazi Party. Um, he then left it because it uh, didn't feel American enough. Um, and so basically created another organization called the National Alliance, which was basically devoted to Nazi propaganda, to, to ideals behind um, the Nazi regime. Uh, with the goals of destroying American society and government and replacing it with a pure Aryan order. So it basically embraced Nazism, um, its hatred of Jews um, and people of color and its desire to create a pure white government, um, but just wanted to put it into a more American idiom, um, which is in fact really what the Turner Diaries does. Um, and so you can see some quotations here. So, um, uh, uh, if the white nations of the world had not allowed themselves to become subject to the Jew, to Jewish ideas, to the Jewish spirit, uh, this war would not be necessary. Uh, we can hardly consider ourselves blameless. We can hardly say we had no choice, no chance to avoid the Jews' snare, right? They see themselves as utterly enthralled to the Jews, and um, they see the organization battling the Jews. If the organization survives this context, no Jew will anywhere. We'll go to the uttermost ends of the earth to hunt down the last of Satan's spawn. Um, so you can see within this, um, even just in these nooses and in some of the imagery, there are absolute res um, reflections of this kind of vision of an anti-Semitic, of a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, designed to bring down white people and violent, ultimately genocide. The organization ultimately is successful in killing all Jews, all non-white people, and instituting a complete white order by the end of the book. Um, and as I mentioned, the Turner Diaries have actually been um, incredibly successful um, in uh, calling for um, and inspiring um, racist white violence. The most um, horrific um, and the most successful uh, was the Oklahoma City bombing of 1995, which killed 168 people, excuse me. Um, uh, sorry. Um, uh, this was um, an act, if you don't know about it, it was an act created, by, uh, an act organized by Timothy McVeigh, um, who, I'm so sorry, 
that is my timer and I'm trying to cancel it and it won't cancel. Sorry. There we go. Um, he was, uh, he believed that the, um, the Turner Diaries, uh, were, he, he would mark up passages in the Turner Diaries, give them to friends and to people to read. He was clearly motivated by the Turner Diaries. And in fact, in the Turner Diaries, there is an instance of the, the destruction of, I believe, the FBI building that, um, that he, he conducts. He uses the diaries basically as a manual to be able to have done. He mechanically puts together the car bomb, which he um, parked. Um, at the at the Mura complex um, in precisely the way that it was described in the book. Um, but there have also been 14 other incidents uh, that resulted in 32 more deaths, meaning that 200 people have been attacked um, by people who have either actively cited the Turner Diaries or have been found when their um, uh, houses were searched, they found the Turner Diaries as, as inspiration for their attacks. Um, and so it's actually not the Bible of white nationalists, but the racist right. Um, it is worth noting that given the outcry and given the clear connections between the Turner Diaries and what happened at the Capitol, the book was dropped from Amazon. You can't buy it anymore. So even if you wanted to read it, you wouldn't be able to buy it. Um, and it also was dropped from Abe Books and other rare book um, collections. Every time you buy a new copy of this book, you are funding. Um, uh, racist white people who are, are seeking to gather money in the way described by the Turner Diaries to be able to, to fund these kinds of attacks. And the final thing that I would want to leave you with um, is simply that this, this quotation um, has been cited by a lot of people who watched what happened um, at the Capitol, which is not only, it, it was not only and was not seen even in the book um, that a lot of people needed to be killed. In fact, William Pierce, the author, actually sort of distanced himself from the Murrah, from the Oklahoma City attack because too many people were killed. The goal was not necessarily in killing people automatically, um, but it's really in the psychological impact. Um, this quote comes straight from the Turner Diaries. Um, and you can see, to me, this ending is really chilling. More important, though, is what we taught the politicians and the bureaucrats. They learned today that not one of them is beyond our reach. They can huddle behind barbed wire and tanks in the city, or they can hide behind the concrete walls and alarm systems of their country estates, but we can still find them and kill them. And I'm sorry to end on that note, but I'm going to end on that note. Um, uh, and I look forward to talking with people uh, during the Q&A period. Um, thank you, Kirsten, for, uh, uh, Professor Fabregas, for again connecting us um, to the historical antecedents of, of things that we are witnessing today. Um, uh, next is Professor Walter, who will also um, elaborate more on today's anti-Semitism. You have to unmute yourself. As Al mentions, I'm going to talk about anti-Semitism today in the here and now. Um, when I came to MSU in the early 70s, uh, I came to teach about anti-Semitism, which was an ancient phenomenon. I had no idea that after teaching for 40, 45 years, um, I would be teaching about contemporary policy issues, uh, talk, talking with students about the responses to actual events of anti-Semitism in the here and now. Uh, anti-Semitism is an animus directed against Jews based on a portrait of Jews as extraordinarily malevolent and powerful. Uh, the anti-Semite sees the Jew or the Jews as a danger, as a threat to the general good, as a threat to uh, the nation, or as a threat to the racially elect. Um, Anti-Semites uh, rail against the Jews and proclaim, as we all know, that Jews will not replace us. Um, they proclaim that Jews are against the peace and well-being and security of our nation. And so they claim that uh, Jews are powerful enough to send lasers from space. Um, 
didn't know the Jews have a space program. Um, and Jews are uh, eagerly creating or taking benefit from uh, the pandemic, um, which they call the Jew flu. For a time after World War II, in, in my perspective, uh, it seemed possible to think that such hatred might be, might possibly be surpassed, um, minimized. Um, obviously, if you've been listening to Kirsten and, and, and John, um, there was anti-Semitism in that intermediate period, um, but we didn't see it so much. Uh, it was dwarfed by the size of the Holocaust. Um, but in the last 15, 20 years in particular, there has been a resurgence of anti-Semitism, a rise of new anti-Semites and anti-Semitic organizations, and a real radical creation of a constellation of uh, movements and, and uh, uh, community organizations that threaten to bring it alive again. Um, and, to, and bringing it alive to recycle some of the tropes that Amy Simon talked about and uh, that uh, uh, were in the Turner Diaries. Um, the resurgence is global. We need to remember that we're part of a larger scene in which anti-Semitism is resurgent all over the globe. Um, and in particular in Europe, um, uh, there have been events of mass murder. There have been events of mobbing of synagogues. There have been killings of individuals on the street. Um, and all of Europe, uh, the Jewish communities, uh, are in a defensive mode, uh, protected by parading soldiers, um, threatened with real threat to life and limb. But the case is also true that in the United States too, there has been a resurgence of this kind, um, surprising people um, because it makes us equally uh, anxious and equally threatened um, by risk to life and limb. Um, the massacre of Jews at the uh, Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh um, in October 2018, I believe it was, um, really shook the Jewish community in the United States up. Um, the American Jewish community thought that we were exempt from these kinds of uh, episodes. We thought uh, uh, it, it happened over there somewhere, wherever over there was, uh, but it didn't happen here. But this was the most massive killing of Jews in American history. Um, and it happened in our midst just two years ago, three years ago. Um, and the American Jewish community began to wonder whether American Jewish history is so exceptional as it was thought. Um, all of Jewish institutions, uh, whether synagogues or Jewish centers, um, had to harden their defenses in the wake of this kind of episode. Um, and all of Jewish students uh, of whatever age now attend Jewish institutions where they learn in some way or another, either through uh, uh, active shooter drills or uh, bo uh, bomb alerts uh, and, and so forth, that there are people in this world, in this country at this time, who wish to kill Jews and may do so. Um, So we should make no mistake about what the mood in the American Jewish community is. It is dark. It is less optimistic than it was before the events of 2018 and 2019. Um, and uh, we live in a situation where we're constantly worrying uh, that if we don't practice defense, um, we may wind up like the people in, in Pittsburgh. Who are these dangerous anti-Semites who threaten our stability and our security? Uh, I wanna say, broadly speaking, that they are largely located on the right wing of American life. Um, they're white nationalists, um, neo-Nazis, um, and what we call um, identitarians, um, who believe that there should be a white dominance 
in a white ethno state. Um, and they think that Jews are a threat to their dominance and their belief in creating a white ethno state. Um, there is a broad theory that people who want to study this stuff ought to know more about, which we call the Great Replacement Theory. It's not really new in uh, the study of anti-Semitism, because 100 years ago, uh, there were writings in America about the passing of the great race and worrying that uh, whites weren't uh, re reproducing them significantly enough that they were committing race suicide. Um, the great replacement theory harkens back to those hundred year old uh, claims. But now there really is a great replacement theory, uh, which is that in the midst of all the economic and uh, uh, population change in the world now going on, um, there is a likelihood um, that the white European identity or the white race will be displaced and replaced um, by another group. Um, and that kind of thought, that idea of displacement and replacement runs through a lot of what passes for anti-Semitism today. Um, Talking about a number of different kinds of groups, and if we were to study this together um, with an eye towards differences as well as similarities, we'd find that there's some neo-Nazis who look very much like updated Nazis. Um, racialist, uh, rooted in racialist thought. Uh, we would also find white supremacists, they're a little bit more loosey-goosey. Um, and we'd find identitarians, which is a word that comes from uh, Europe, um, who simply say they're not racist, they're not Nazis, uh, they simply want to preserve the white European identity in an, in an era of change. Um, it would be useful if we had more time to list some of these groups. I imagine that most people don't know these groups and wouldn't recognize them um, simply from their names. Um, Identity Europa, the Vanguard, uh, groups like this, uh, um, all of these groups share in this broad thought um, that current events are moving against the white race or the white European identity, and they must do something um, to uh, hold that movement back. All these groups oppose immigration. You can tell them uh, 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 that they are those kinds of people, um, uh, especially immigration of uh, people of uh, color. Uh, all these people uh, believe that immigration is pulled and motivated, moved um, by a Jewish catalyst. Um, you want to understand what happened at, at the synagogue in, in Pittsburgh, um, the white racists there. Uh, believed that the synagogue was connected with Hebrew uh, Immigrant Aid Society and they were bringing immigrants to the United States to threaten them. Um, the sad thing is that in this day and age with a lot of freedom of access to guns, a lot of these movements, a lot of these groups are armed. Um, and they're not only armed, but they have members who participate in armed actions, assassinations, kidnappings, um, things of this sort. So these are groups to be watched and to be feared. Now, the amazing thing, I want to close with, with this set of observations, is that in the last four years, something has happened that probably has surprised all of us, and that this set of groups, this constellation of groups on the right, have moved closer to the center of American politics, because the grand old party, the Republican Party, has tolerated their existence, winked and nodded at them, um, and permitted them um, to police their own meetings. Um, it's never been the case that right-wing uh, racists and national, nationalists have been front and center of the party action. And another surprise, because our politics are stymied, 
stalemated. Um, one of our two major parties are still linked with these kinds of people. Um, they are not embarrassed by them. Uh, they take actions in impeachment proceedings uh, that put them on their side and acknowledge, um, uh, you know, justify what they do. And so uh, I want to close with a kind of warning because um, I, I think this is more than a taxonomy. This is more than naming things that are dangerous and saying, watch out for this. We're in a period in American history, it seems to me, um, where the likelihood of action by these forces is to rise rather than to disappear. Um, in close party, act, uh, party division in the United States, where one party uh, aligns with these people, um, in uh, other kinds of disjunctions uh, in, in our ability to protect, project a stable future, uh, whether it's economic depression or so forth, we're in a period where this threat from the right um, is not going away. Uh, a lot will depend on what uh, politics, what the administration is able to do um, to dampen this kind of effort on the right wing, uh, to make it uh, less legitimate and uh, uh, to tell people how worrisome it is. Um, but in the absence of any such action like that, I believe we're in a difficult period of time uh, where things are going to get worse before they get better. Now, thank you, um, Professor Waltzer, for not only kind of having us focus on the physical danger uh, these groups pose, but also the danger of their gaining greater legitimacy, um, as again was witnessed by the Republican caucus kind of applauding <laughs> Representative Green, who holds a lot of these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. So there's um, both of those dangers. Um, I see lots of questions. So I'm going to maybe collect two or three um, to ask at a time um, to you all. And then you guys, uh, you all can decide whether you all want to respond um, or only a couple of you. That's up to you. Uh, so we have a question. Um, uh, uh, what is the root of anti-Semitism? And I'll combine that with some similar questions by Ben Walter. Leon Weitrub asks, um, is, you know, discussion of white ethnostate neglected to mention a frequent overlap with muscular white Christianity, which is a frequently a synonym for white Christian identity? Um, and is there a, uh, Beverly Wiener asks, is there a demographic, cultural, economic profile of white nationalists, neo-Nazis, and anti-Semites? Right, so kind of, and, and another question looks to, are there markers um, that we might look to, to look at kind of a growth of anti-Semitism or, or predict a growth or an increase with their social, political, economic, right? So several of these questions speak to the root of anti-Semitism, um, the nature of it in terms of, uh, white nationalism and the characteristics of white nationalism uh, and whether they're also kind of uh, conditions, cultural, economic, and demographic that would signal that perhaps uh, Professor Walzer's uh, prediction that this will increase as opposed to decrease in the short or immediate term, um, what, what kind of conditions would, would make that kind of prediction um, accurate, right? So I've tried to collect, I'm collecting three different questions, but since there are now 16 questions, I'm trying to group them in some way. So you might answer any of you one of those questions or a couple of those questions. You don't have to address all of them. Well, I'll start us off. I hope others will, will join in. People are only beginning now to, to map um, anti-Semitic actions and to, and to kind of um, identify which groups are dangerous and which groups are not. Uh, for instance, I've been spending a lot of time recently uh, reading about uh, militia studies. Um, I was in the Capitol on April 30th when the Michigan militia were there with guns um, and swastikas, by the way. Um, and there's nothing like being in the midst of that um, to turn something inside you to trying to figure out what the hell is going on? In my capital, in my state, um, people are walking around with swastikas. 
So I've been studying the militia a little bit, and we know a few things, right? It's rural rather than urban. Um, it comes from people who generally do not work steadily in institutions, but they're kind of uh, separate and, and, and apart from them. There's a sociology of the militia movement. Um, but not all militias are anti-Semitic. Some of them are just anti-government. So people are beginning to map this now to figure out just what the dangers are and which groups are, are special dangers and which groups are not. Um, the observation about white Christian identity was a good one. Um, there is a white Christian aspect of this and the white European identity that people want to preserve on the right is a white Christian European identity. And there's a recycling of very Christian ideas um, about supersession, about uh, what the proper place of the Jew is. Um, and so we will do everything so that they won't replace us. All of that is part of a constellation that, that fits together. But a lot of this is so new that we're beginning to try and get a, a grip on the whole thing. Um, there are no published studies on the militia yet, uh, of book length. Um, and so we're trying our best to figure all this out. But in the midst of a radical political change in the country, um, we're all watching the same things on the TV as they happen. Uh, it's very hard to predict uh, stable responses, um, stable political actions um, as have existed in the past. Um, so um, it's a good question. What's the origins of this? How pervasive is it? Where can we identify it? Uh, but we're in the midst of studying it now. I would say, I mean, in terms of roots of anti-Semitism, I think that, I mean, there are a lot of roots of anti-Semitism, but um, the way that these things are linked um, is that, you know, one of the major roots, uh, one of the early roots is exactly through um, anti-Jewish uh, texts and teachings within the Christian church. And so it's not a surprise to me that you know, following not only, I mean, in, in my class, we start with the teachings of Paul, and we think about the ways that the um, early biblical texts framed Jews as the antithesis uh, of the, the, the pure, you know, spiritually uh, advanced uh, Christians, and, and supersession is part of that as well, right? Taking over uh, providing the truth, uh, and then who's left but the liars and the hypocrites, and that, you know, became the Jews. And so we start from there, and of course, we all know the the long history of the the Crusades and the blood libel. I mean, you saw even in the photo or the pictures I showed, they're, they're all being crucified in those pictures, right? That's because it's it's about the Christian church. It's about worries within the church. It's about um, you know, the way that, again, the image of the Jew as opposed to the, um, the, the, the Christian, and it moves into Martin Luther, right, who reforms the church and uh, becomes frustrated that Jews don't adhere to the new teachings. And so it goes on and on in terms of uh, that long history. So again, I think it's not a surprise that that element of the white identity, uh, white European identity is firmly rooted in, in Christianity. I'm not saying all Christians or anti-Semites or anything like that, and te teachings have changed radically uh, since, you know, certainly since, you know, early Christianity, but, you know, even into the modern period, um, Christians generally aren't taught these, you know, nasty anti-Semitic tropes the way that had happened in the past, but obviously it's still out there, and it's something that these groups have, have picked up on and, and taken as, as part of their mantra. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop with that. I mean, there's there's more to say there, but that's one of the routes that we can follow through. Actually, the one other thing I wanted to say is is about the um, kind of the moments. You know, usually what we've seen in the past, where there's moments of you know massacre and you know clear targeting of Jews, have been in moments of upheaval and uh, and revolution. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the protocols in 1903 around the Russian Revolution. I'm thinking about obviously the Holocaust and, or I'm thinking about pogroms of 1880 and the change in Russian government and then the revolution there. And then, uh, you know, the Holocaust obviously after World War I and, and uh, you know, radical, uh, you know, radicalization of politics in the wake of that disaster. So I, I don't know what's happening today. And like 
pre-COVID, right? This was this has been going on pre-COVID. I'm not a political scientist, so political scientists out there, you know, please help me. Um, but I I've been a little um, con confounded in in trying to explain what's happening today based on my historical model. So maybe I'm in the wrong field for that. <laughs> I could add something to the discussion we've had so far, which is focused on kind of Christianity as uh, um, kind of the ur root of, that's a bad metaphor, as the deep root of, uh, of anti-Semitism. My, my work is in the history of science, and it's important to realize that in the late 19th and into the 20th century and into the 21st century, an important root of anti-Semitism has spoken in a scientific voice. So. I'm interested in the history of scientific race itself. Professor Walser mentioned a Madison Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race in 1916. Grant is writing at a time when the Jew is seen as a, a danger to the genetic, not his word, uh, the genetic stock of the nation, uh, um, um, outbreeding the Nordic, the noble Nordic and the noble Teuton. Um, Another aspect of that book is Grant's idea that Jews are taking over scientific inquiry. Franz Boas is establishing American uh, uh, anthropology at Columbia. Uh, Grant despises Boas, who's a German Jew who's immigrated to the United States and has reshaped anthropology. Grant starts his own scientific society, and you can trace, it's, it's, I have traced, there's an anti-Semitic undertone to the anti to, to, to the revolt against scientific reasoning that shows races into biological reality. There's no indication of racial superiority. Not an insignificant pushback to that is this concern about Jewish control of scientific data and publications. Um, and I think it's important to remember when we're talking about uh, economic distress and things like that. Who, those people at the militia, what were they reading that brought them to that? Um, the author of the Turner, Timothy McVeigh, was a disaffected ex-army soldier who blew up the Murrah building, but William Pierce was a physicist who had a very high paying job, who was economically successful, and all these ideologues that I study, these aren't people in economic distress. These are people who think they have the answer to why the world doesn't look the way they want it to look. And they are supplying the ideas to the people who show up with the guns, to the people who show up in the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh synagogue, right? So I think it's important that we acknowledge that during times of economic distress, conspiracy theories tend to, people grab onto them. Better th this explanation than no explanation for why uh, the world is in chaos. But there are people out there who aren't experiencing that economic distress who are choosing to put forth these ideas. So, and, and, sorry. So I just want to add briefly. I mean, I would sort of echo. I think a little bit of what Amy and Ken said in the sense that historians are really bad at predicting, <laughs> and also um, not very good, even necessarily in seeing patterns. You know, like I mean, there was a really prominent historian of anti-Semitism who did sort of envision sort of ebbing and flowing, but mostly that not a lot of historians sort of maintain that still. But I would say that actually one thing to think about is sort of political instability, like in addition to economic distress, maybe is political, or maybe that's a problematic argument would be some um, political instability. And I think it's important to think about the power of the Cold War um, in sort of stabilizing politics, giving people something else to hate and a different kind of identity. Um, and I think that it's, you know, the, the, the fall of the Cold War or I think led to sort of, I think, more um, instability politically and more of a sense that these might be answers. Um, so more ratcheting up of, you know, Oklahoma City is 1985. Um, and I would just add to that, that the last time there was a real resurgence of anti-Semitism in the US was before the Cold War, it was in the 1930s and the 1940s, right? So I do think that that provided a kind of stabilizing force that made these ideas, it allowed these ideas to sort of, you know, ferment, but not necessarily um, be quite so visible or so accepted um, in sort of mainstream spaces as we're seeing today. Um, so I think that plays a role at least. Thank you. So I, I see there's um, about four questions that deal with kind of left-right. So um, 
Anna Claire uh, Gerson and, and um, um, I, sorry if I, with my handwriting, um, I'm not pronouncing the right, the name right, um, and Emil Aiden and Lauren Harris all kind of um, acknowledge that um, the greatest threat in terms of anti-Semitism comes from the right, but they're also asking about uh, for you to speak about anti-Semitism from the left um, and uh, uh, whether some of that exists in the BADS movement, for instance, whether uh, Pelosi and her caucus had kind of more of a, also a, that they kind of also sometimes tolerate anti-Semitism and don't have as strong a reaction as they should to some anti-Semitic statements that were made by the squad. Um, Lauren Harris points out, so so they're saying, yes, you know, our panel is focusing on um, the greater threats from the right, but don't um, Democrats also and those on the far left, um, um, you know, not take as seriously as they should anti-Semitism. And then Karen Harrow speaks to, well, um, is part of what's going on um, uh, one could turn to Netanyahu and his policies um, that feeds into that. And then in conversation with that, or I'm trying to put them in conversation, Steve Gold adds, well, what about the uh, impact of Jews um, who support rightist positions and contemn Jews on the left, right? So we have a conversation among five in the Q&A as to kind of this right and left, and even though the threat is greater from the right, um, what about the left and what feeds into that? And what about also right versus left kind of Jews themselves in the conversation among them? I'll take a first stab at that. Um, the organization I worked for after I retired is the Academic Engagement Network. And we were largely focused on anti-Semitism on the left on college campuses. Um, so uh, I agree with the questioner um, who raises an issue about anti-Semitism on the left as well as on the right. Uh, it does exist. It affects campus life. It cheapens and, and, and uh, uh, messes up the discourse on campus. Um, stereotypes about uh, countries and peoples and so forth find easier out in the conversations on campus now than they did five years ago. Uh, it's not uh, surprising for us to hear a student get up and saying uh, Jews own all the media or Jews are powerful um, Jews are privileged um, they can't be uh, oppressed uh, and those kinds of things so I'm concerned about that uh, and, I, and I think it's particularly important to, um, uh, on campus where we try to have open and free conversation with one another and dialogue um, but I'm not as concerned about that as I am with the actual danger uh, that lurks on the right. And it's becoming uh, much more visible to us in the last three, four years. Um, and, and if I want the government to do something, I want them to investigate these groups. Uh, I want them to take a position that... Uh, uh, openly says this is wrong, this is uh, opposed to the American idea, um, and we need to use uh, the resources we have, like the FBI and so forth, uh, to investigate where this is festering and, and who's pushing it. Um, you can't live in Michigan these days without thinking about that. Um, and uh, at least that's the way I feel about it. Anybody else want to join in? So we've certainly had um, speakers who've come to comp campus who've talked about anti-Semitism on the right and left and my contributions to some of our panels um, when Ken's not there or when Ken's there is also to address um, some of the anti-Semitism or when under what conditions uh, anti-Zionism can, can end up using uh, anti-Semitic tropes or, or uh, raise questions as as to anti-Semitism. So we're focusing on the right today, but certainly um, we've had speakers and panels which were more broadly talking about anti-Semitism from the right and left. Uh, 
Professor Vermeulen, you look like you want to say something. Well, I just wanted to sort of add and sort of to, to add to Ken's point that I think that, you know, uh, Jewish defense groups as well as the FBI sort of have found that, you know, the danger from far right groups and the anti Semitism within there just is, you know, a much more existential, dangerous threat, I think. I mean, it's certainly important to consider anti Semitism from all sides, wherever it comes. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, but I think that the, the sort of the, the incredible visibility and, and the real physical danger um, and political danger that is associated with anti Semitism on the right for me is, is just far more scary, I guess. Um, and, and, um, uh, we wanted to sort of address it because it has been so pro the, these images have been so prominent and we want to kind of take them apart for people and, and think about it in real depth. Yeah, and I, th I think there definitely was worth kind of having that focus in this particular um, teaching and panel. And I think there's no question, I don't think that the, the greatest physical danger domestic terrorism comes from the extreme right. If we look at the second part, though, of the danger to the legitimization of anti-Semitism, one could still argue that it's far more um, dangerous on the right uh, and, and, uh, and have a legitimate ground for arguing that. But if one, one cares about kind of, I, I would just uh, throw in, if, if one cares not only about the physical um, dangers and domestic terrorism and so forth, that is definitely coming from the far right, but kind of a legitimization of all kinds of anti-Semitism and conversations one has with colleagues or students or students are exposed to in various ways um, or uh, are coming from the far left, then you might see kind of this increased legitimization on both sides, even though it's not to the same degree or the same danger. And I think that that's what maybe three or four of the questions um, uh, were pointing to is the danger of legitimization of anti-Semitism um, uh, in, in, in various quarters. Um, I am going to ask a couple more questions that were, were put up there. Um, one is by uh, Michael Serling and uh, asking, you know, uh, do American Jews, have American Jews um, felt a greater sense of security because they can kind of uh, blend into, or most of them, uh, not all of them, can blend into this white majority and um, find cover from anti-Semitism and prejudice there? And he brings up, of course, um, Professor from English's book on name changing, um, right, to combat, uh, combat anti-Semitism. We also have a student, Anna Crowley from um, History 392, who, harking back to the earlier um, presentations, um, uh, is saying, um, can't we um, find a way of acknowledging and mourning uh, the targeting of other groups in the Holocaust, such as LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ people and um, the Roma, and how can we do that without, um, uh, you know, um, without running into the danger of somehow soft peddling um, uh, the Holocaust in terms of, of Jews uh, and, and getting to Holocaust denial. Um, so those are two um, questions um, that I'll pose from those that I've seen uh, in terms of both kind of Jews having a sense of security by being able to blend into a majority more easily, um, but also how to handle the targeting and murder of other groups in the Holocaust without minimizing uh, the special targeting of Jews. I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to address that second question on, on how to acknowledge other victims of Nazi genocide, um, which I think it's fair to say that, and I feel like I should really defer to Amy on this because she's the real Holocaust historian, but it seems to me that, that people who study the Holocaust always are looking for ways to do that, that acknowledging that anti-Semitism was the central core of the Nazi genocide does not diminish the suffering of other folks. Remember the first people who were put away to concentration camps were political opponents, were communists, not necessarily Jews, right? But we can also distinguish the Jewish experience of the Holocaust um, even even from the other victims, right? And and if you go to the website of like the American Holocaust Museum, you you see them uh, uh, have whole sections on on the other victims. I mean, the thing that 
one of the lies the Holocaust deniers say is that um, Holocaust historians ignore other people. And I don't think that's true. I don't think, I, I think it's an ongoing struggle to figure out how to do that to the extent we can speak of the Holocaust at all or genocide at all writ large, right? There's a, there's a, I know there's debates among genocide scholars trying to figure out the Nazi genocide and, and uh, is it fair, is it reasonable to compare it to um, Stalin's starving in the Ukraine or, or uh, the Turkish genocide of Armenians or Pol Pot or Rwanda. Um, these are all things that are talked about, right? I don't know what the, there will ever be a definitive answer to it, but it is something that people are working on sincerely. So I'll say that. And I would say, I mean, it's about, it's about intention, right? So like these people that, that John's talking about, these aren't people who like honestly aren't sure about the suffering of Poles versus the suffering of Jews or, you know, the destruction of Dresden versus the, you know, Auschwitz or whatever. These, these are not people, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, who like really aren't sure and they're trying really hard to figure it out. It seems that they are more the people that have a particular view of the world and, um, you know, are, are spreading these kinds of uh, these kinds of myths uh, as a result of that worldview. Whereas, yeah, absolutely, of course, Holocaust historians are always asking these questions: Is the Holocaust unique? If so, how? What does it mean? You know, these are uh, you know legitimate discussions to have. And I just wanted to give a couple of anecdotes. I think one of the big dangers of the soft core denial that you were talking about is not just kind of again the people that really believe it and you know are trying to get it out there, but the way that it can um, just kind of make its way into into normal people. <laughs> I hate to say that as maybe an incorrect way to say it, but like people who don't know any better, right? Um, into their perspectives and worldviews. And I've had it, I've had students in class question me about, a student in class question me about the, the numbers question about the Holocaust, like clearly has heard some of these things elsewhere and then brought it into the classroom in a kind of like, way that made me very uncomfortable, but perhaps came from a place of ignorance. And I actually randomly, one time I was taking a Polish class and I literally, one of the other students in the class, American student, you know, say to me on the street, yeah, well, just as many Poles were killed as Jews. So isn't that just the same? And so I think once these like ideas are percolating out there, it also becomes kind of scary and dangerous um, for people that aren't going to go and take my 392 class and, and actually spend the time doing the real work of um, thinking about what these things really mean and how those comparisons may or may not be useful. And I'll just respond to the question about um, Jews sort of feeling like they can join the white majority. I mean, I think that that has been what has so, I mean, that has been a strategy for many Jews, as Yale points out, not all Jews um, are white, and so therefore not all can can participate in the strategy. But yeah, I mean, my, my work is about how Jews were able to change their names um, and 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 try to sort of become invisible, right? To sort of shed some kind of sense that they had a marker that they were different as Jews. And I think that one of the things that's been striking, and I, I remember right after um, uh, 2016, right after the election, I went to a conference and uh, one of my colleagues pointed out something that I didn't even know, but now I think is quite, most people know that, you know, it, it, the far right and, and racists began putting three um, parentheses around Jews' names, right, to be able to, to, to identify them, right, to be able to supplant that. And I think that's been one of the shocks that, you know, that was my first shock to it. And then Charlottesville was another, right? And then Pittsburgh was another, right? So there have been all these ways that I do think there has been in the past, in the past, say, 75 years, Jews have sort of, white Jews with white skin have attempted and have seen themselves attempting to sort of be seen as white. Um, successfully frequently, but I think that the past few years have been a reminder that not everyone does see them that way and that they have been making quite conscious and explicit efforts. And I think there has also been an effort among Jews as well to um, to sort of reject the racism within that whiteness, right? To sort of say that they want to make common cause with people of color and, and not 
not to simply be invisible to, to racists um, and allow racism to continue. So I think that's happened as well. But I, I do think there's been quite a shock um, in these past few years um, in seeing the ways that Jews um, for, for racists and anti-Semites are defined differently, right? They, they doesn't matter that they have white skin. There's something separate. I will collect maybe about four or five different questions and that'll be our last batch of questions. And it's great that we've had so many questions. So we have a very engaged audience, which speaks to the caliber of the panel, I think. Um, and, and unfortunately, the um, importance of anti-Semitism today. So the last, um, a couple combined with the last question that you might end with, and then I'll give you another grouping, is what can we do, right? Um, what actions can be taken uh, to confront this growth in anti-Semitism that you all have been speaking about. And Alyssa, is it Baskin? Again, my handwriting when I write it down, I'm not sure, also suggests as part of it, how do we educate our students and young people um, to ask questions and so that they not, you know, to question kind of soft anti-Semitism, so to speak, right? Um, so what, what, you know, at the end of the day, to leave on a kind of hopeful note, what, what, what can be done uh, to confront this? And then we have a couple of other questions if you want to weave in or can weave in that speak to um, a couple of people talked about Jewish defense, you know, is this kind of a term that's used more often? Daniel Engel asks, you know, how anti-Semitic is QAnon, you know, in terms of, you know, we had that image on uh, the flyer, but haven't spoken, you know, quite as much about them yet. Um, and then there are two questions, one about the IH, IHRA definition of anti-Semitism that some governments are using, um, how significant is it outside these high-level high government um, circles, and to what extent uh, can one talk about Israel and Palestine um, without having to, you know, with, you know, what questions would you have to think about without uh, having to worry about crossing lines of, um, of anti-Semitism. So those are kind of what I'm all throwing at you, but maybe if you could address um, what you would like among those questions. And then, uh, you know, I know some of us could, could have discussed for a whole other hour, but a lot of you have family obligations and are zoomed out. So I'm also trying to respect everyone's time. So address whatever question you'd like, but maybe if you could also address at the end, uh, what, can, what can be done, you know, given these horrible circumstances. I'll take on the question about what's to be done. Um, it, it's very clear that these white nationalists want to create a certain kind of society, um, which is racially pure. Um, that they want to overturn many traditions of America um, where um, all, all people are equal. Um, uh, they oppose multiracial democracy. They oppose even pluralism. Um, and it seems to me the, the first line of defense, the first commitment is to defending um, multiracial democracy, defending um, uh, our history of rights creation uh, from uh, the post-Civil War era to the present, uh, extending those rights, voting, uh, uh, protecting voting rights and so forth. Um, and I be, I'm beginning to think of that kind of strategy as a, a, a direct response to the kind of great replacement theory that these white nationalists share in. Um, they, they worry about Jews, imaginary Jews who are catalysts of, of the anti-racial movement, and they worry about the invaders, uh, the people who are the immigrants coming in, um, uh, often in, in images of them coming in in large numbers and uh, taking over. Um, I, I see the white nationalists responding in El Paso uh, to Hispanics uh, in a Walmart, very much like I see them responding to uh, the, the Pittsburgh synagogue. Um, where uh, a, a lot of people were killed, I think 32 overall, something like that, in, in the El Paso. Those should be our natural allies. Uh, if they have an imaginary view of what's happening in the world, and they depict the, uh, us as part of something, and uh, they also depict others as part of something, we should be aligned with them. We should be tied in with them. We should be as concerned about their rights as we are about our own rights. So uh, it, it seems to me kind of um, uh, it follows logically from 
from what's going on that we ought to be doing active multiracial democracy aligning with uh, other minorities who are targeted by these kinds of people and uh, defending openly 